Ladies and gentlemen, happy Monday. Greetings from Zurich, Switzerland, where it's 5.45 a.m. in the morning, local time. It's a great pleasure to welcome everybody from around the world for the Horasis Asia meeting. I'm very excited to be the moderator of this upcoming panel, China and its new economy. The Chinese economy is the first to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, but how will the superpower grow next year in 2021? This is the big question we are going to ask today over the next 45 minutes. Premier Li Keqiang said, of course, last week that he expects uh, the economic activity in the country to return to a, quote, reasonable range in 2021. But what does that mean exactly? We are going to decipher this in a moment. And can China rely only on its dual circulation, basically consumption and production, as well as innovation, as the 14-5-year plan has laid out? So we have a lot to discuss over the next 45 minutes. Stay tuned for this really exciting session. And without further ado, I would now like to welcome our top panelists. Uh, first of all, we have Herbert Chen Wu, he's the Managing Director, The Economist Global Business Review, joining us from Beijing today. Herbert, thank you so much for being there. It's, it's my great pleasure. Yeah. We also have Ms. Zhe Peng, she's the President of the Tsinghua Asset Management Group in China. Hello to you, Noon uh, Peng, great to have you Hi. here on the uh, program as well. We're also online, uh, James Knight. He's uh, the global China editor of the FT based in Hong Kong. I know he's been uh, trying to dial in, but there seems to be a little bit of an audio issue. And we're supposed to have uh, David Pan. He's the executive uh, dean of the Schwarzman College at Tsinghua University, joining us from Beijing as well. I cannot see him online yet, but let's hope that we can get um, Dr. Pan join us very soon as well. So Herbert and uh, Pan, I would like to start with a very short question to both of you to start to kick off this session. Now, the name of this panel is China and its new economy. But do you think that it's actually a new economy after the outbreak of COVID-19 or are the uh, old structures Still there, Pong. If you don't mind, ladies first to kick it off. Is it a new economy? Oh, I don't uh, think Pong, we can hear it, right? you for some reason. Uh, no, you're not on mute. I'm not sure what the problem is. Maybe Herbert, go ahead, take it away first of all. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have a first kick. So I think it's gonna be a mixed economy because 2020, I think for every country, it's a sea change. I think the two major trends, there's still uncertainty on globalization, right? So that's a, one of the key challenge for China to grow in hey, the ne next five years. That I can find. I'm just not sure if they can hear yes. me. Yeah. Um, we can, I think, hear James now. Ah, okay. I'm good. okay. You're there. Okay, okay. James. Um, we are hearing you. We can see you yet. But you're coming on just now. Okay. You're muted Thank now. You. Okay, fantastic. James is joining us from Hong Kong. He is the global China editor at the FT. We'll give you the um, word very soon. So, Herbert, please keep going. Yeah. So, I think if you look at the, you know, I'm talking about the two major trends, the mega trends. A, of course, is globalization. There's still a lot of uncertainty involved with globalization, and China's uh, policies and China's activities also have an impact on the future trends. And the other thing, of course, is the acceleration of digitalization, and uh, it's pr also pretty obvious in China that uh, companies and corporations benefit most post-COVID are those companies who are very much embedded in the China's e-commerce and China's other digital initiatives. And we would argue that, I would argue that uh, there's a great opportunity for China's, you know, the, the digital infrastructure, but not necessarily in the 
aspects of building new warehouses, digital warehouses, digital cloud services. We do need that kind of services, but really invest in the kind of B2B management, in the kind of B2B services of China's economy. China has, you know, in the past five years, we've witnessed the boom in the kind of e-commerce B2C area. But actually, to make that sustainable, you actually need to invest a lot in the B2B area, meaning that providing these small and medium-sized operators online, the kind of management know-how, the kind of operational efficiency, the kind of tools, online tools, cloud-based tools, so that they could actually grow faster, grow better, and create more job opportunities for more people. So I think that's an area that's interesting and that could be characterized as new. And then, of course, on the flip okay, side, we also leave it there, Herbert, for okay, now. Okay, yeah. That is uh, your solution. Pan, let's make sure we can hear you as well. Are you there? No, um, still the same issue. Maybe log on and off again and change the mic setting. But um, we have changed now. We can hear you. So um, we just have the opening question that I asked uh, Herbert. Basically, is China's economy new or are the old structures uh, still there? James? Uh, thank you very much, and uh, apologies, I had a little bit of an issue with my microphone, but Frank sorted okay. me out, so I'm all good now. You can hear me now, right? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, wonderful. So um, the way I would uh, approach this question is to say that big parts of the Chinese economy are actually being remade at the moment, um, particularly in the technology area, um, an area that I focus on here in Hong Kong. Um, I think it's well known now that uh, China leads the world in several uh, high-tech areas. Uh, just to remind people, high-speed rail, ultra-high voltage uh, electricity transmission, solar and wind power, some forms of artificial intelligence, digital payments, and many other areas. But um, the, 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 the two that I would like to uh, highlight uh, today are electric vehicles and digital currency. Um, I think these are really fascinating right now for a couple of reasons. Let me take electric vehicles for a minute or two. Um, China's undergoing a boom in electric vehicle sales. Uh, last year, it sold 1.2 million electric vehicles. This year, we're seeing that rise sharply. And the government plan is that by 2025, more than 4 million electric vehicles will be sold, and that will be about 25% of the total, which is up from about 5% last year. Um, this target does not at all seem uh, fantastical. Um, this is because of a couple of very important things that are happening in China first before they happened in the rest of the world. And the main thing is that the price of electric vehicle batteries is falling to what is known as cost parity uh, within the in, in, internal combustion engine, by which I mean when the price of, of, of a battery falls to about 100 US dollars per kilowatt hour, which is supposed to happen in 2022, 2023, um, down from about 160 right now, that will mean that electric vehicles can compete on price with uh, traditional combustion engines. And already we've seen a real boom in the stock prices of a lot of electric vehicle companies, uh, BYD, their um, um, price to earnings ratio is at currently 245 times, which is extremely high. It shows the, the level of enthusiasm for electric vehicles uh, in China and among stock market investors. And the other key company is CATL. They're the, the big Chinese EV battery maker. And the price earnings ratio there is about 117 times. So again, you've seen a really big uh, shift. The other one is digital currency. Uh, this is uh, even newer uh, as a topic than electric vehicles. And 
China is planning to launch a digital currency. This is the central bank digital currency, as opposed to those which have, you know, which which, which are currently operating by Alipay and uh, and, and WeChat Pay. Um, uh, they're planning to launch that in around the time of the, of the Winter Olympics uh, in um, at the end of. 20, is that 2021? I think so. Um, yeah, this will mean that uh, China is at least a couple of years ahead of the closest competitor. Um, uh, several other countries have planned, but China is far ahead. And it's also fascinating to note that uh, China has al already launched applications for about 80 patents for its digital currency and trials have already begun in several cities around China. So in many senses, and I think this really chimes with what the previous speaker was saying, uh, the digitalization of the Chinese economy is proceeding faster than any other economy uh, in the world, any other major economy in the world. Um, and so in that sense, the Chinese economy is being made anew. Uh, the paradox is, though, that at the same time, the aspects of the Chinese economy, particularly state-owned enterprises, state-owned enterprises' dominance and power in the economy, is certainly not new. Um, and so I do see a something of a, par of a paradox between the new technology areas and the old traditional state-owned enterprises kind of coming back and all of the problems that they bring with them, such as financial mismanagement, uh, fraud, corruption. And we've seen some of that in the bond market defaults over the last few weeks. Absolutely. And we will get back to that very soon. Very interesting digital currency. Of course, we have to watch this space. Some are even saying that the Chinese e yuan will become more important than the US dollar at some point in the near future. Uh, let's discuss that in a moment. Juan, can you hear us and can we hear yes. you? That's a good question. Yes, yes, yes. you're on. Okay. Fantastic. So, Juan, the same okay. opening Thank you. to you as well. The topic of this panel is China and its new economy. What is new in the Chinese economy or are the old structures still there? The floor is yours. Our virtual stage is yours. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'd like to address in three perspective. First it is about, you know, this year is the end of the 13th five years plan and I just launched uh, the 14th uh, five years plan recently. So the first uh, I'd like to mention about high quality uh, growth, uh, high, high quality growth economy, but also high quality growth. For, for companies. I'd like to address from AI perspective, artificial intelligence. Previously, we more address about artificial intelligence technologies, but now we see more emphasizes on the application user scenarios. Uh, for example, AI enabled manufacturing, AI enabled the uh, life, they are enabled life science. They are enabled the uh, uh, with the 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 pharmacies or that sort of things. So it is kind of a AI change the life or and also AI improve the industry. This is a more uh, on the ground things. The second thing I like to say about the uh, globalization. Just recently, uh, the UK the, the chamber. The China Chamber of UK launched a report about Chinese uh, enterprises um, development in, in UK. I would like to share some interesting findings there. It says the three quarters of the company have reinvested all or the majority of their profit generated by their UK operation back into the UK. Well. 60 percentage business employed fewer Chinese employers than those of other nationalities. Uh, it's compared about 10 or 15 years, uh, or for the last 10 or 15 years, it's more about the China uh, 
invest, direct investing to UK from China, but now it's kind of coming to a more, we say, uh, organic growth about Chinese uh, uh, enterprises in UK. This is more about the globalization things. But on the other side, you know, just the Chinese uh, government launch the more uh, initiatives about the uh, GPL, uh, PD, uh, we say, more encourage Chinese investment into overseas. Uh, the third thing uh, I'd like to say more about the, uh, we say, capital markets. Uh, you know, uh, about uh, last year, China launched the, the start market. It's about that we call it science technology, uh, the markets. It's more promote uh, high tech high tech companies to be listed in the Chinese stock exchange. It is all in the Shanghai stock exchange. So you can see uh, more and more uh, Chinese high tech companies. Um, for example, the, the father thing, uh, the life science companies, the uh, advanced manufacturing, uh, information technologies, they have another, uh, they have more uh, another way to raise capital. Uh, I think that that's a good going to be a new new sign in the in the new new, new economy. Thank you. Thank you so much for your opening remarks, uh, Pang. That's really, really very interesting. Let's pick up on that. Herbert, the 45-year plan mentioned the key word innovation about 47 times. So this is really one of the main pillars. And you already mentioned the digital infrastructure, of course, as well. In which area do you see the strongest growth when it comes to innovation? I think you know there's a, a, a it's it's widely being discussed that uh, China is very strong in AI facial recognition. Uh, uh, James has mentioned quite a lot, so I think there are two important things that we are still doesn't have uh, 100 percent clarity. One of course is that what kind of changes and reform uh, the Chinese government is going to try to push in Chinese colleges and uh, universities because we know that. They've enjoyed a lot of resources, but of course, at the same time, there's kind of a doubt on many of these uh, academic uh, institutions, whether they are capable of doing both basic research and push some of these applications into business. There, so there's a concern about many of the universities become bureaucracy rather than really innovative engines. So that's one concern. On the other hand, of course, that uh, we've seen China has done a much better job, not only try to uh, tr drive the growth of VCs and other kind of uh, uh, private equity funds, but also the government is playing kind of a larger than life role in terms of investing and also directing the investment in many of these industries. One uh, exhibition, exhibition A is uh, the Hefei gov uh, municipal government's investment in uh, Weilai, right? You know, one of the key leaders in the, uh, uh, the, 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 the new uh, electricity cars. You know, a, a year ago, Weilai was on the brink of bankruptcy. And then, of course, it took the courage of a local government really taking the risk, investing in the company. And then now, actually, the payback for the municipal government, I think, is at least 10 times. Right. So that's so that you, you, you have both the uh, kind of concerns that the China's uh, uh, university needs more reform, but also you have the kind of plus side that some of the local government are really innovative and are willing to taking risks. We have to mention here, of course, also Ant Group's uh, IPO that was supposed uh, to happen, the dual listing in Hong Kong and Shanghai. It would have been the biggest blockbuster IPO ever of 35 billion US dollars. Now, what does that mean for the future of uh, China's fintech companies and unicorns? What do you think, James? You must have covered that story for sure. Yeah, I did cover it. Um, I think we were all really enraptured by that story. Um, I think a couple of things went on specifically with Ant. Um, and they, they have a couple of, uh, of implications for the broader fintech and financial development in China. The first thing, is, which has been widely publicized, is that there's no question that Jack Ma um, significantly irritated the government by making a speech about regulation. Um, that was definitely a factor. 
But I think it's important to put that in the broader context. And the broader context is that the regulators in China, particularly the China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission, were growing very concerned about fintech. Um, now, we have to remember that, that China's had a couple of issues with financial control. One of them was with the growth of uh, shadow finance after the great financial crisis. And the other was the more recent um, peer-to-peer lending boom um, that took place around, you know, 2016, 17, 18. And so the regulators in China are very concerned about big financial bubbles emerging. And they were they were looking at fintech and thinking that this could be the next bubble. There are all kinds of technical issues with regard to collateral and the speed of growth of the fintech industry that was embodied in what the Ant Group was doing that gave the regulators really severe pause for thought. And so the cancel or the suspension of the Ant Group IPO was an attempt to you know, reassert control over that area in advance of new regulations with regard to fintech coming out. Um, and I think that's, uh, I think that is sort of uh, in, 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 in train at the moment. I think it shows a couple of things. First of all, it shows that sometimes the pace of innovation in China is so fast that the regulator is left behind. Um, and I think it also shows that And this is an echo of what I previously said, the sort of split nature of the Chinese economy. On one hand, you have these incredibly entrepreneurial companies growing up very quickly. And on the other hand, you have a government which is not quick, often um, and not responsive um, and used to calling the shots and not used to listening to industry. And therefore, they often get left behind. And this is a a big paradigm. Um, it's a big paradox within China's developmental model, I think. Huang, uh, you are obviously active in the asset management industry with uh, Tsinghua Asset Management. Now, we've been talking in China so much about the supply side, structural reforms, and so on. We've just mentioned some of the reforms that are going to be necessary, according uh, to James. What kind of reforms would you like to see as an investor? Oh. Huh? Yeah, I think she. Are you back? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Can okay. Uh, yes. Uh, wait. Yes. Uh, Go I'm ahead. From Tsinghua. Uh, actually, we've done a lot of. Uh, yes, we've done a lot of uh, uh, investment into our, we say, technology transfer things. So. Uh, we 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 are happy to see more and more uh, mature policies launched uh, to promote you know, the university uh, teachers students to do more and more uh, startups. Uh, so looking forward, uh, uh, we still think uh, the government can still can take a more active role in promoting innovation in terms of. The first is more build a more uh, friendly, innovation friendly uh, ecosystem. So uh, that's in terms of how to, uh, we say, more if and industry, how to integrate these three uh, uh, factors, you know, the industry. Uh, to test and to apply their, their, their technology. And also they need the capital to support the technology growth. So at uh, Austria, uh, the industry need to have good technology, advanced technology to do upgrading things. So we really would like to see uh, some more, more policies or, or initiatives to uh, more enhance the, we say, inclusion of technology, finance, and example, we say, uh, star board, star market is a good example, but you, we already, they do got make the, the star. 
uh, actively to be more better support the uh, technologies uh, companies to live to be listed. Um, the other things I would like to still address the uh, globalization, although the Uh, we still... well, you're breaking up a little bit. Yes. Can you still hear us? Yes. Okay. Okay. So we, we we still see more and more connections or with global innovations. For example, one of our startups was acquired by uh Merck by a by, by American big pharmacy companies and also uh I see this year, one of our uh, startup company based in Beijing acquired a very uh, a very interesting technology. They do multi uh, multi screen controls. So they are the uh, Chinese uh, online uh, conference. The, uh, multi -screen the line controls. Is so we still do see of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, activities happened uh, cross border. So that, yes, um, you're breaking up a little so bit. Definitely, we we'll so see more uh, the Chinese. People, yeah, the stability of the connection is not really granted. So let's maybe um, keep you uh, there for a moment, Huang. And while we're getting the Wi-Fi connection back, yes. in the meantime, I would like to. Uh, quickly move on to Herbert. Herbert, obviously we have a new geopolitical picture now going into 2021 with uh, the U.S. election and President-elect uh, Joe Biden. How do you think will this change the tech war, technology war, not just the trade war as well? And what will it mean between the United States and China? What kind of impact uh, do you think will this have on the innovation and technology sector in China? So I think that's a trillion dollar question everyone is really interested in exploring. And it, it's going to be in the kind of interaction between China and the Biden new administration. But I think what we are assured that uh, we're going to come back to the kind of rule based discussion and engage, uh, not necessarily engagement, but uh, at least, in a, you know, there'll be more channels for proper discussion on issues that are concerning both parties. But I want to highlight two important things. One thing is that we cannot fall back on the existing institutions and rules to address new problems, especially the, with the rise of the digital economy. Right? You know, there are issues about uh, data security, data sharing, data hosting, cross-border data traffic, and privacy. So these issues need new consensus or at least a kind of basic mutual understanding of not only China, U.S., but also Europe and Japan to have a better understanding of what we need to do, both in terms of reining the big technology platforms, but at, at the same time to encourage kind of sharing and encourage innovation growth. So that's one area. The other area, of course, I, I, I've seen a sense that's a kind of a danger down the road because uh, both U.S. and Europe have signaled that uh, they want to build a kind of grand alliance. And that kind of grand alliance is actually singling out China as a target, right? So do we want to end up in really a kind of Cold War scenario where the rest, the West is actually uh, really competing and uh, make China as a rivalry? I think I, I would hope that in the next year or two, there will be more multilateral dialogue so that we can share. I, I understand that the uh, Europeans and Americans have a lot of concerns about China rising and what does it mean for the global economy. But I think there are many is many areas. Digitalization is one area. Uh, uh, the, the, the global warming is other areas that the, all the parties need to sit together and come up with new ways to address issues. And at the same time, I, I don't want people to really fall into that kind of a new Cold War mindset. It's going to be lose lose for everyone. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's hope that the uh, decoupling scenario is not going to become a reality. And great that you mentioned climate change as well. We'll get back to green finance in a moment. Just a quick question to James as well. You mentioned uh, EVs, you mentioned digital currencies, and so on. 
uh, all areas where China is leading at this point in time. But do you really think that China can actually become a tech leader as well? Can China become a leader in technology change? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think, you know, in certain areas, I think China already is the leader or a leader. Um, there's no question about that. Um, but um, I think your question really points at what some of the things that Herbert was just saying. Um, and this is the sense to which geopolitics will intervene. Um, and I think... In this regard, again, you know, echoing what Herbert said, digitalization and data is really the center of the battlefield that is being drawn now. Um, and I just wonder whether the more sensible approach will be for the US and China to say, okay, we cannot cooperate. We do not trust each other your data and my data should be kept separate um, and thereby creating separate data entities, which is already halfway there, considering the, you know, the great firewall and various U.S. Uh, efforts to restrict Chinese entry into the U.S. market. Um, I wonder whether that is, is maybe a more sensible approach, just to admit at the start, we don't trust each other. We have to have two separate data worlds. Um, and then that would allow um, the US and China to cooperate in areas where they do trust each other. And I think those areas are, 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 are many. You know, I mean, look at the trade between those two countries. Look at all kinds of other types of cooperation. Um, it may be that data is just too difficult because... There is so much embedded in, in your own laptop that I certainly don't understand. You know, there's so much. It, this is an intransparent area. It will never be transparent. There's so much that my computers, all those cookies know about me that I don't know that they know about me. I don't trust my own computer. You see what it's I'm saying? Computers. It's it's a smartphones, right? <laughs> well, well, I'm on a laptop, at the moment, but also the smartphone. So yeah. we, we, we're in this world where the companies themselves are highly intransparent. Whether they're US or European or Chinese, they're all playing the same game. They're all taking our custom and not telling us the truth about what they're taking from us in terms of data. So I think this is a huge problem. This area is a massive problem. Yeah. Well, would you agree with James on that point as well? Well, it is a very interesting question because uh, China launched some kind of, uh, uh, we say, legal uh, legal policies on the uh, data protection, on data things. And also, actually, uh, it is highly uh, mentioned in the, uh, we say, the, the star board, uh, the star market. I know uh, we see a few um, companies uh, is applied for the uh, starboard and about the data. Uh, uh, also, this quite uh, this companies have either they are in the financial. I think we've just lost Pong now. I would like to take a question uh, from the floor as well from Gregory. He would like to ask you, James. Um, it's not just we, about we, the USA. We're happy to see they, these companies have done a good job on that. Uh, they, yeah, they have very, uh, we say, good procedures to, to do data collections, uh, data uh, handling James, things. James, I think the question is for you, right? And the, the, also the they train uh, from, from the data properly. Floor. There's, a, there's a comment from uh, Gregory. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, your connection is a bit unstable. We'll get back to you shortly. In the meantime, James, uh, there is a question for you. It's not just about the USA and China. What about the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, and data? Right, okay. Well, as everybody knows, uh, China is trying to build a digital Silk Road. Um, and this is part of the whole Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI. Um, 
you know, it, the progress towards this, I think, is mixed. Um, but I think the basic question, the basic problem with data remains. And I would just repeat that it doesn't matter to me whether it's Chinese companies or American companies or British companies, German, French, whatever. They're all engaged in the same game. They are none of them are taking our privacy seriously. They are all harvesting our data without telling us, proact certainly not proactively telling us what they are harvesting and what they know about us. This is a global problem. It isn't a problem of China versus the West. It's a global problem, and I might, but but it creates a global um, environment of mistrust, of distrust. I personally have no trust whatsoever in Google or Facebook or Twitter or any of these companies. This is the problem. So it doesn't matter about the BRI and the digital Silk Road. It's all part of a global problem. In the last nine minutes, I would like to focus a little bit on green finance as well and China's new climate targets um, and then take a few questions from the floor as well. So in terms of green finance, maybe Herbert, um, obviously we have the new um, policy and, and very ambitious pledge by the Chinese government to become carbon neutral by the year 2050. Let's hope we can see some more concrete uh, implementation measures there as well. Do you see concrete opportunities in green financing, Herbert, and what do you make of it? So then I think green finance is a kind of emerging area. So there are kind of two areas that's really booming. A, of course, that there are new investment opportunities that when China set the target, we will be very much assured that there will be going to be plans to implement that. So in terms of really addressing pollution, addressing to lower the carbon footprint and try to encourage more investment in green technology, that's sitting assured. And what's also interesting, of course, is that, you know, there are more people uh, exploring whether a brief finance itself, meaning that coming up with new ways of financing or having more both stay owned as well as private uh, financiers, including the kind of a green finance. I think that's something new. It's being discussed. We haven't seen much of a major progress yet, but it's an interesting area. And I think when China's when the presidency is being said that uh, by 2060 China would uh, have certain things done, it's also shifted, uh, highlight a major shift in terms of the growth model. That's what China aspires to be. Right. So, as James has pointed out, the fact that uh, the boom of the electric vehicles, the highlight of various other different kind of uh, uh, new energy uh, generation, clean energy generation, I think that's an area that also have the scale, have the policy. Thank you so much. We just okay, have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, David Park yeah, yeah. now. He's, of course, uh, the uh, dean, executive dean at the Schwarzman College at Tsinghua University in Beijing. So we only have six minutes left. Uh, I'm very sorry about the time pressure. I need to stick to my Swiss uh, timing here. Dr. Pan, um, we've been talking about the 45-year plan. We've been talking about China's digital economy. We've been talking about the U.S. Uh, elections and so on. So just in a nutshell for us, uh, maybe if you can present your views on China's new economy there, the drivers, but also the risks are coming from in the next, uh, let's say, you know, five years, according to the 45-year plan up to 2025. Okay, thank you so much. So nice to see you. Thank you. And so sorry. So the internet got a big trouble here. I, I Dale, Dale can, cannot get in. Sorry. So nice to see you here. And real quick, thank you. And uh, you know, in the last two days, last two days, uh, the weekend, you know, we learned a lot. In, in the on campus through uh, the ministers and through the uh, famous uh, professors uh, from uh, uh, the party university in China and uh, we like uh, got a trend 
about the next five year plan. Next five year plan. That means uh, we have to know what's going on next. Uh, the, we call the 14th uh, five year plan. So for the next five years. And the keywords, the three keywords. The first uh, uh, the, uh, keywords is the quality. So all the speed, Chinese growth speed is a high quality growth. So we will not mention any growth rate. Even the growth rate in the last 40 years around 9.5%, very high, but now is the quality. The second is a structural change. We call the structural reform. You know, some some sectors in China is the overproduction. Some we need to uh, speed up. So that's the uh, the second word. The third is control the risk. Control the risk. You know, in China, in the last 42 years, uh, reform are opening up, and we have uh, a lot, a lot of successful uh, sessions. But some areas is not behind the growth. And uh, so lack of financial risk, uh, like uh, uh, Martina mentioned in, in the in the email, there is a lack of uh, ant group, lack of financial uh, management, f financial reform, a lot, a lot of things and the debt. So that's we need to control. So we have to control the risk in the next five years. So three keywords. So that's uh, uh, for the next five years. And uh, another one is a, uh, is, uh, we call the due uh, circulation, domestic uh, domestic demands and also uh, international uh, in, uh, 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 export import. But we do both, both. We, that's what we call the uh, due uh, circulation. So that's uh, uh, my point mixed because of time time constraints. So the quick, quick, uh, give you the, the key, uh, key thought. Thank so, you. Uh, thank you. For that, Dr. Pan, I would like to give the last words to uh, Pan. We only have two minutes left. Any um, assessment uh, for the next year as we go into uh, 2021? Any worries, any concerns that you have for China's new digital economy, please? Okay, uh, I think the most important things is about the, 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 the they got the proper application, proper user scenarios. That, that's one of the very important things. Uh, the other definitely is security things, of, of course. So we are very, uh, I think next year is a lot of the challenges. Uh, we already see in the startups uh, also because next year there's a lot of restructuring uh, of the economy, but we still see uh, the good company will definitely will be survive, will be uh, will be outside there, and definitely we'll see more and more merger and acquisition uh, will be happening uh, in the next couple of years. And on the on the other side, of course, we say uh, very. Uh, uh, in the maybe in the first place or second place, they can go to public to be to be so to be public. That can lead the industry, of course. Yes. Thank you so much to our top panel. This wraps up our session. Uh, we are coming to the end now. And let's, of course, hope that we all stay healthy. This is the most important thing um, for next year as well. I would like to thank our fantastic panelists. Uh, James Kneitsch, he is the Global China Editor at the Financial Times. David Pan, Executive Dean, Schwarzman College at Tsinghua University. Herbert Chen Wu, Managing Director, The Economist Global Business Review. And Zhe Pang, President of Tsinghua Asset Management Group in China. Thank you very much for joining us. Stay in touch, connect with each other, and I wish you a great rest of the Horasis Asia meeting and a fantastic okay, weekend. Thank you. thank you so much, everybody, and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.